Do you want Zoom end-to-end -end encryption? Pay up. Signal responds to protest surveillance, and Google faces a $5 billion fine. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for June 9th, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. I'm gonna jump right into the news. We have some Zoom updates. Two critical vulnerabilities in the Zoom software could allow attackers to hack into the system of participants involved in a group chat or individual recipients all remotely. Both are path traversal vulnerabilities, which could allow for the attacker to plan malicious files on a system running the Zoom conferencing software. Little to no interaction from the user is necessary, making these a very high severity. All the attacker would have to do is send a malicious message through the chat to a user or a whole group. Now, the vulnerabilities were found by researchers over at Cisco Talos and our CVE-2020-6109 and CVE-2020-6110. The first one happens because of the way Zoom handles Jiffy or Giphy messages, so an attacker could embed the GIF or GIF sent from somewhere other than Jiffy or Giphy, which is automatically cached on a system. The second has to do with the way Zoom handles code snippets sent via chat by zipping the code snippet, sending, and automatically unzipping upon receipt. The extraction does not actually validate content, so it could be used to send malicious code. These are both fixed in version 4.6.12 on Windows, macOS, and Linux. But all is not well in Zoom land. It turns out that Zoom's end-to-end -end encryption, which the company was discussing as a part of their security build-out in the coming months, will only be available to paid accounts, not free. According to reports, adding E2E encryption or end-to-end -end encryption would exclude users calling in via phone lines and also would not allow Zoom technical support to add themselves to calls. But Zoom CEO Eric Wan spoke with investors saying that E2E would not be available available to free customers because they want to give local law enforcement and the FBI access to calls since, and I quote, some people use Zoom for a bad purpose. Zoom gave additional reasoning in a statement to the press saying that free users sign up with an email address which does not provide enough information to verify identity. So Zoom only wants to provide encryption to users who can actually verify their identity. Now many folks though may not want to verify their identity through an application, if they are victims of abuse or violence, or they are media sources or whistleblowers, and they need to protect their identities as much as possible. Zoom has continually stated that they do not monitor content of meetings or record them without user knowledge. With large-scale demonstrations and protests comes the threat of digital surveillance, with this week being the most recent example. Motherboard has reported that several law enforcement and federal Federal agencies have purchased an upgraded device to the Stingray, which is now called the Crossbow, which is meant to surveil 4G devices, allowing for location tracking and the ability to track IMSIs. Now, while little is known about the technical aspects of a Crossbow, redacted emails show that it is an upgrade to the Stingray, which can tell us that it's a device that pretends to be a cell phone tower, allows phones to connect to it, and collects data about connected devices such as the IMSI the location data again, and sometimes call or even text data. Now these devices are not discriminatory towards any specific device, so anybody within that vicinity could accidentally connect to them. It is unknown if these devices are currently being used to surveil protesters, but the DEA also requested authorization last week to expand their ability to conduct covert surveillance outside of the normal agency abilities. This, along with the ability of police to use geofence warrants to collect data based on a physical location, not a single device, sparked many concerns amongst privacy advocates, myself included. Encrypted messaging app Signal has responded by announcing a new blur tool that can allow you to hide faces in your photos before sharing them, which can be used at protests. Now, in a blog post, Signal creator Moxie Marlinspike said the newest version of the application for iOS and Android includes the blur feature within the image editor. All of the processing happens locally, and it does not detect every single face every time, so you can use a brush tool to also blur 
color faces manually. Now I just tried that today. It's really cool. It's very, very easy to use. I do have a couple of examples in this video with a photo that I took within Signal and a photo that I took weeks ago so you can see what it looks like. I have shared several tips as well on my YouTube channel that can help keep your identity safe when practicing your First Amendment rights, so you can also check out that video linked below. Hey, before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash threatwire. Make sure to pay attention too because I have some announcements coming. My Hush Puppy Perk Level patrons, they're so awesome. Thank you so much for sending in your fur baby photos. These new ones are adorable. Also, I have a new perk that has just been added. So now anyone who becomes a patron will get access to ongoing discounts for my online store. I also now ship internationally as well so you can get 10 to 20% off any of the merchandise, any show stickers, digital photography, t-shirts, whatever you want, anything just for being a Patreon supporter at any level. And if you want to support Threatwire, but you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, check out snubsy.com shop to get Threatwire stickers, t-shirts, and even that digital photography, all of which supports my shows. Now there is so much to cover in security and privacy, and I never have time to discuss everything that I want to in these ThreatWire episodes. So if you want to see me cover more information security news as an audio podcast or even a second episode of ThreatWire each week, check out the next Patreon goals to see how you can make that happen. Google has been in the news quite a bit this week, for better or for worse. First, Google is now facing a class action lawsuit for $5 billion, that was with a B, claiming that it has been tracking and collecting browsing information on people even when using incognito mode. The lawsuit was filed in San Jose, California, and it speaks to Google's use of Google Analytics, Ad Manager, and other applications or plugins that it uses to compile user data. While incognito mode is supposed to allow for surfing the web without collection of browsing history, session, or cookies, a file system API still allows for data collection even in the recent update of Chrome 83, even though Google has said that it was implemented differently in Chrome 76. So that was a while back. On a positive note though, Google has also recently opened up its Advanced Protection Program, or APP, for Nest devices and Nest users. Advanced Protection Program allows for users to add an additional layer of strict security to Google's suite of applications in Android devices, but it was not integrated with Nest until now. The IoT devices can now be managed and controlled under an APP-protected Google account, and Nest users also have the ability to add 2FA and login notifications. Now before I leave, I want to say thank you so much to Rian, Robert, Perilous, Scott, Andrew, Clayton, Ashley, and Greyhood. We got tons of new folks joining the Patreon team this week. Thank you so much. You are all so awesome. Also, I just posted a video on my own channel about protecting your digital devices from government surveillance, and all of the proceeds from that video are going to charity. The link is in the show notes below. Thank you so much for watching, and do not forget to like and subscribe. I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.